Well, uh, it is 5.30 here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you guys all for tuning in to our webinar this week. Last week was our official kickoff, um, but this week really kind of shared it to the public because we saw the value in interacting with you guys and helping you answer some of the questions you might have in regards to cover cropping and um, just regenerative agriculture in general. So we're going to do our best to keep on schedule here and keep things running. Um, but this is only our second webinar, so I do apologize if there's any hiccups along the way. But I do think you're going to get a lot of value out of this week's session. Um, I'm going to start here before I introduce our panelists, just want to go over some basic instructions for Zoom here. All of you attendees are, are muted at this point so that we can give full attention to the panelists. But at any time, if you have any questions, there is a chat and a Q&A at the bottom of your screen where you can type in your questions while the panelists are speaking and we'll try to get those answered. Um, and we're going to, I have some set questions for the panelists, but at about 6.15, we're going to open it up to you guys and allow you to ask some of your questions. So if you have a question that you feel is worth um, asking the panelists over a video, you can hit the raise your hand button and I will unmute you and let you um, ask those questions. So. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. Today we have Brett Peshek from Mountain View, Oklahoma. Colton Catterton is near Maryville, Missouri. And then Jonathan Cobb, are you like from Temple or what's your official town? Uh, Rogers is the closest incorporated town, okay. but Temple's where the grocery stores are, so. Okay. Well, we'll start with Colton. Uh, he graduated from Northwest Missouri University with his bachelor's degree in, ag in agronomy with a minor in precision ag in May of 2011. He then continued on to get his master's degree in agriculture, focusing on alternative forages and cover crops while his wife finished her degree. Colton has been with Green Cover Seed since 2013 as a sales rep in Missouri, and he spends his free time in the great outdoors pursuing anything with a heartbeat in a season. He operates an expanding sheep ranch in the fertile hills of Northwest Missouri with over a hundred ewes of commercial I don't even know how you pronounce this. Obviously, I'm not a sheep guy. What is it? Catahedon hair sheep, Colton? Catahedon. <laughs> Catahedon. Okay. Go ahead and just kind of briefly share uh, your operation. So basically, I've been working with Green Cover Seed for a while, going to a lot of conferences. Um, and then finally, in 2018, we got our opportunity to start our operation here in Missouri on the small acreage. And uh, so I, I got... Years of listening to influential speakers like Dr. Alan Williams, Gabe Brown, uh, Greg Judy, and so on. And so I took the best of each of their practices, morphed it into the beginning of our operation, which is hoping to get to about 400 years in the next two years. Very cool. Next up, we have Brett, who grew up in Clay Center, Nebraska, on a small farm with sheep and moved to Oklahoma to work for Green Cover Seed in 2016. He started his own farm operation in 2017 and bought his own property in the fall of 2019 to implement more diversity other than just cattle to produce food and to trial as many different regenerative practices as possible. He runs a 30 head of cow calf pairs and retains his feeder calves through the winter on cover crops and perennial pasture. Brett utilizes minimum fed feed on his cattle herd and has added pigs in the last few months to add additional income and give alternative marketing to the farm. So Brett, go ahead and kind of explain how you got to that point. Yeah, so I, uh, I went to the University of uh, Nebraska. I grew up in a small town in, in Nebraska, pretty close to the Bladen facility actually, and uh, come to study cover crops for wildlife nutrition. Uh, growing up, wildlife and outdoors has always been my passion. And so I started studying cover crops back when I was in high school and kind of followed that into my college days. And that's where I started uh, shadowing and, and interning with Green Cover Seed. And that's where I really found the soil health, started going to conferences with them. Uh, started, I think, No-Till on the Plains was my first conference that I went to that really broke through that soil health was a key factor, not only for wildlife, but for livestock as well. And so uh, it's been spiraled down here of which project to do next, which, which idea should I try uh, and try to 
keep it economical <laughs> on my own operation of, of all the ideas that, that we can do in regenerative ag, so. Yeah, very nice. Um, finally, we have Jonathan Cobb, who is a fourth generation steward of his family's land in the Blackland Prairie of Central Texas. After earning, earning his business degree and spending several years away from the farm, he and his wife, Kaylin, decided to leave the urban life and continue the farming tradition. Five years into row crop, farming thousands of acres with his father, Jonathan and Kaylin nearly left the farm because they didn't see a future in the industrial row crop model. Thankfully, before leaving, they were exposed to regenerative agriculture and learned that there was hope to both regenerate their land and enhance profitability. In addition to stewarding their pasture-based farm, Jonathan provides soil health consulting and serves on the boards for the Grass-Fed Exchange and Holistic Management International. So Jonathan, um, I will give you a chance here now to kind of talk about your operation as well. And it looks like you are, you're muted here. Sorry. <laughs> Zoom etiquette. Um, <laughs> we're all getting used to. Yeah, so that was a, a short of it all. Um, you know, very similar to Colton and Brett's stories as, as I was exposed to soil health and, and started realizing the importance of, of soil health, things started clicking and making sense. Um, when we lived in the city, I, I worked as a landscape designer and so some of the concepts um, made, made more sense coming out of that horticulture world. Um, to me and so it, it, it clicked pretty pretty easily once I was exposed to it um, but um, yeah uh, got involved with green cover seed though that's not in that little sh short bio uh, in 2012 because um, we we understood the the role of diversity from the annual cover crop mixes and being able to to make those mixes and so I contacted Keith in 2012 and that's when we first met and I've been working um, with the company since then, uh, kind of as a, a strange one in the early days. So uh, as far as not being in the structure of things as, as the company was growing, but um, now do consulting work with Understanding Ag and, uh, and serve on those boards. But our operation has moved from uh, row crop to introducing cattle and then introducing sheep. Um, we've run pigs for several years, we don't have any this year, but, um, and then uh, ran some laying hens for a while, um, but primarily sheep now is, is what we're doing. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna get us started here. Uh, like I said before, I will um, take some questions from the audience. So if you guys wanna put those in the chat or the Q and A, um, we will get those answered uh, right around 610, 615. Um, but first, for you panelists, what are you guys seeing in the markets with COVID-19? Um, we talked about this at the beginning here. I'm seeing a lot of empty shelves, but the price is not seeming to reflect that demand in the markets. So how is this affecting your respective industries? So Colton, why don't uh, you go first here with, with sheep? Uh, so I, I saw a very interesting video that Texas A&M put out, I believe it was last week, where they talked about the wool market the European sheep, wool sheep, and then the hair sheep markets. Now the, the wool market and the European breeds, the wool breeds of sheep seem like they're gonna be hurting pretty bad because a lot of their cuts are used in cruise lines, high-end restaurants, that kind of uh, marketplace. And there's only a few slaughterhouses. So if those few slaughterhouses shut down, it's gonna be detrimental just like what we're seeing in the cattle market. But then the hair sheep on the other end, seems like it's a lot more direct to kind of consumer or there's a lot of smaller processing facilities. They'll process it on a local community basis. So they expect that market to maintain pretty well as long as people can maintain jobs and afford to buy uh, what is a relatively expensive meat compared to the others. Yeah. So Jonathan, you run a lot of sheep as well. Is that kind of what you're seeing uh, in your area in Texas? Um, it'll remain to be seen for us personally, because we're not in marketing season right now, we're in, in lambing season as far as uh, how we primarily market now. Um, our direct market stuff is pre-sold the year before uh, so that we know what to raise um, as far as finishing out um, on those lambs. So that's 
not yet affected. Um, I do think that the folks who were in position of um, in in the direct market pasture based world, those who are positioned in a what I would call large to mid size um, that have re their really good supply chain uh, set up uh, for demand. I think they've they've been in a really good position to to take this uptick um, and have that supply. Um, hopefully that will stick uh, for them and hopefully we'll see some paradigm shifts in the way that that people are buying because what I would like to see people learn from this is that there is stability in diversity um, just like we see in nature. I think the same is true to be applied for the processing facilities. You know, if we rely on a few packing facilities that come down with employees that, that get struck and unable to work in one region, then we're very vulnerable as a country. Um, and so having diversified spread out um, producers and um, processing facilities, um, hopefully we'll see a change in that because it's been going you know the other way for the last 50 years. So that remains to be seen though, once everything kind of shakes out. And then I think the economy is gonna play a big role. Um, you know. A lot of people without jobs right now and so it's going to be interesting times ahead but i think we all need to be ready to to adapt and and shift our operations where we can to take advantage of it yeah so brett you're a little bit different because you are dealing more with the, the cattle and the pigs um primarily cattle what are you seeing in the cattle market uh cattle market it's a mess <laughs> um it, it, like Jonathan said, you know, it just really proves, oh, hold on. Okay, no. Uh, so it really proves that, you know, the food security issue uh, of just having a few slaughterhouses that are processing 95 to 98% of our, uh, you know, the, the local slaughterhouses, they're doing all right. Uh, they were pretty busy uh, to before this uh the their dates are, are really backed up but uh, uh they're only handling maybe two percent of our uh beef out there in the united states that's getting processed and going to the consumer and i would say that's a that's a friendly estimate um so the fact that that the rest of the country is relying on on several main packing houses to stay open um, because of working conditions uh, uh, with the virus going around, whether you believe in it or not, uh, it's, it's a concern. And so it's been manipulated in the cattle side um, to where the highest box beef prices in the stores we've seen, but nothing has trickled down to the producer. And that's just an indicator, you know, it, that we need to start looking at direct marketing if we want to capture that not be vulnerable in those scenarios uh the hog market uh i would say that it's always been down on a commercial scale uh on on they've they've struggled animals or the hog hog market's always been down uh they're always competing with these viruses and flus going through these swine houses and uh just not been there, but the direct marketing on, on hogs and, and beef and sheep, uh, everybody that I've talked to, they've sold out in a matter of days and, and they can, they wish they had more in the freezer. They wish they had more stock to support their community. Um, so hopefully the community starts looking to them for more future references than just a, a, a scare. And so I think we'll see some transitions there. Yeah. So speaking of markets, how have you guys structured your operation uh, around the markets and how exactly do you market that? Is a lot of it direct to market? And um, Brett, I'll let you start this one. Okay. Yeah, so I, I try to direct market as much as possible. Um, when I first got into the cattle business, uh, I structured my marketing of what can I still sell at the sale barn? You know, you can have the best cow out there um, but in reality, on the beef side, it's hard to go from nothing to selling 30 calves a year on a direct market source. Um, I don't want to, I want to deem it undoable, 
but so I was, I still relied a little bit on the cattle side. I'm adding the pigs to my operation to add to the marketability of my beef. And I think that's, that's what I've been doing. And we're seeing more of this across the country of having more products, more diversity of animals on farm to market their main, their main product or add to their bottom line. So, um, I want to produce food. Uh, I want to produce for my community and I would much rather sell to my neighbors than sell to somebody that's six states away because they don't get to see my animals. They don't get to see the respect that I do for my animals. And, and to me, that's a big, big sale for why I consume my own meat. That's good. Jonathan, how about you? And you're, you're still on mute, John. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, to echo what, what Brett said there at the end, um, I mean, it, it was very important to us um, to produce high quality um, meats and produce off of, our, off of our land for ourselves and for our, our community. Um, however, with our context, and I want to stress the context of everybody's place because um, everybody's got different uh, land base that they have to support different families they have to support different bills that they have to pay uh, different sized houses uh, all of those things so context is really important um, when listening to people talk because um, my my situation is not yours uh, but um, we needed to support um, our land base that my parents own and, and that my sister and, and her husband and my wife and I uh, purchased um, in the direct market runway, if you will, uh, trajectory that we were on was a pretty good one, but it was running out um, before we um, wanted it to or, or could sustain. Um, and quality of life is a big thing there. Um, and so being wearing hats of producer and marketer and inventory control specialist, freezer repairman, all the things that you have to do when you're maintaining walk-in freezers and those types of things um, took, took their toll on us personally. Um, and we needed more cash flow more quickly, more rapidly, kind of like Brett saying on the, you know, ramping up that quickly is uh, it's a challenge. Um, but for us, we, we saw the answer to that in the sheep operation. We could scale them up quickly um, and get quick cash flows. The sheep crop is faster than a, than a cash row crop um, as far as from birth to weaning uh, with them. And so we can, um, can get cash flows coming in um, from them. So those were choices that we made. But um, to answer your question finally and more specifically, sorry, um, we structured our operation and our operations continue to be structured around our holistic goals. And what I mean by that is that we, we took as a family, um, a long, hard look at how we wanted our lives to look and our land to look, um, both today, tomorrow, 50 years from now, um, and tooled that around, um, those goals and desires. And then the function of the operations are, and aggregated decisions based around those central goals. Um, financial planning was is one that we lean heavily on because uh, we really believe that being debt free is an important part of having the liberty to do what you want to do. Um, and so we structured ourselves in a way that uh, is based on our financial planning to keep us out of debt um, and to operate without having to borrow money. Colton, why don't you uh, finish off this question? So basically I tried to structure my operation on being a young producer, trying to figure out how to actually raise animals on pasture. Everything before this has been on concrete. So just learning how to be an operator is what I focused on my first two years, trying to learn that art form. Um, so I just structured my lambing operation, not around the highest profits, which would be the first four months out of the year for that, 60 70 pound lamb but more so just lower input farming with nature lambing in may on grass the picture behind me would be our property that we raise um, 
livestock on the last two years and there is no shed. So from negative 35 to 105 heat index, wherever the in between, they've got to make it out there in the open. So. Have you had any challenges with that? I mean, not having shelter, or have they adapted pretty well? So being first time operator, you, you kind of want to see what they can handle. Um, and, but not push the limits. So the first uh, heat index first year is a drought of 2018 Missouri. 98% of the state was covered in a drought. Uh, we had numerous heat indexes, the first one or two. There's a few tree patches on this property, but I didn't want to break up my rotation for other reasons. Um, and so I started off in the shade, but by the time we got to the third, fourth, feet, fifth heat index of over 105, uh, they were just out in the open and acclimating well. I didn't lose a single animal due to heat stress. and when it was negative 35 and six inches of snow, I was really nervous before the storm. I built them a bale um, windbreak because they didn't have a windbreak where they were. I put the bales there and they just sat out in the open and took it. They didn't even sit behind the bales through the snowstorm. So that was the last time I did that. Hmm. So another thing that I hear a lot of people talk about with sheep, especially, um, and Brett, maybe you can talk about even pigs and cattle, but uh, the fact that they're able to find their way through any fence. So Colton, what, what's your fence set up like and how do you manage to keep them in? So because I live on a main highway um, and over here is the lake that you can't see. So the community lake, a lot of traffic goes by. So I, I decided to use a, a high tensile woven wire for the perimeter. But on the inside, I'm just using these O'Brien posts with, I use two poly wires and Jonathan does a little bit better than me, but uh, they'll respect these two poly wires for me if I respect them. So if I made them stay on this side of the pasture where it's eaten down already, they're going to find their way through that two poly wire pretty quickly on me. But if I respect them and if I go out there and I, they know when I come out there, I'm going to move them and I don't just tease them and go back into my house, then uh, everybody plays friendly. But keep that fence hot, hot. I mean, six, seven, 8,000 volts. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter what kind of animal uh, that you have. Uh, having a good fence, respecting their boundaries and, and daily needs is is perfect way what Colton said. And and doesn't matter what type. It's a mental barrier, not a physical barrier, and can't stress that enough. And animals, they're they're smart. They know. Uh, that they can get through it. They'll find a way if they really want to. You might have a problematic animal over time. Uh, so, you know, maybe that, that animal needs to leave the herd or find another good source or marketing way to get rid of that animal uh, <clears throat> to not be a problem to leave your herd off. But more often than not, it's the training, it's the, the, the management behind it if you decide to push it a little bit, that's when you're going to see that that uh, respect boundary get broken on my end, whether it's hogs or, or cattle. Yeah. Well said, guys. Um, I think that's, that's true. Um, if there's not anything to eat, you're going to find your way out. Um, so you can't blame them and, and blame the animals for, for getting out because a lot of most of the time it's our fault. Um, and Colt, what Colton was alluding to is there's a lot of times of the year that we run our sheep um, with a single poly wire. Uh, we use O'Brien steps uh, just like in Colton's picture there. Um, and we run it on the fifth, uh, fifth from the bottom uh, when we're running a single. We tend to, in the fall, when we put our rams in in late November, uh, switch to two wire. Um, and then we run the fourth from the bottom and the second from the top. We found that combination to be the, the best. Um, and the reason being then is that's when the rams are in, things are a little rambunctious. And then uh, also the forage is getting, you know, it's after frost then. And um, when we start getting, uh, Pat, you know, smaller patches of green stuff, little clovers coming up and uh, chicory and plantain and things like that. It, it becomes more tempting to move out of the, the paddock 
before we would kind of like them to. Um, and I've found that sheep really don't appreciate eating hay. Um, they're not as patient with standing around a, a hay bale like cattle are. Um, and so it becomes a little bit of a challenge there. And we move too fast for a bale of hay, to be quite honest. Um, and so I know it's getting away from your fencing question, but I guess we're just having a conversation. So I'll switch into that if that's okay, Noah. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so we built a, um, a kind of a hay wagon. Uh, it's, it's one of those tumble bug uh, that you carry a, a round bell with. We put a dolly on the front of it so that we can uh, hook onto it easily and it carries itself as a four wheeler. Um, and then we just put a piece of bull pan on the bottom to keep the hay from falling through. And um, that allows us to keep our rotation going because our 220 or so head that, that were in the group this last fall, um, it took them about, we just kept it out kind of as supplementation for the rest of our stockpile. It, it took about seven to 10 days for them to go through a, a 1500 pound bale. Um, and so we, we used, uh, I think six, six or seven bales uh, this year, all year, um, as we're trying to build better stockpile. But um, that's our solution to, to the winter fence problems, trying to keep a pacifier in there with them so they've got something uh, in that field. So it sounds like it's not so much about the fence as much as it is the management and making sure that you're providing everything that they need within that fence and, and then they'll want to stay in. So yeah, perfect. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. For perimeter, I guess. I, I was just going to answer that for the perimeter. I was wondering, we don't run just a single poly wire, obviously, for our perimeter fencing. Um, we've got, uh, you know, most of our land didn't have the uh, the livestock infrastructure left in it by, you know, by the time the root crops uh, era was. And so we, we came back with um, four high tensile, um, three of those are electric and um, one's a ground all the way around um, for our, most of our perimeter. And then a property that we bought in 2013 had a woven wire high tensile around it, which is great um, primarily for dog speed on that woven wire because a dog can go underneath the, the other electric wire a little bit faster. Um, I say that more so from our dogs killing neighbors' dogs versus I like to have a buffer there. Just it hasn't happened, but it makes me nervous sometimes. Um, <laughs> if they were chasing something out of our field, I'd like for them to have a barrier. But yeah, I was saying I I've seen similar uh, issues with the hay uh, with cattle side. Um, I don't have that with mine. Uh, but I've seen similar issues that you kind of talked about, John, uh, of just animals wanting to be there, especially, uh, you know, if you're feeding alfalfa hay every day, uh, there's, I know there's plenty of producers that are still using hay or trying to cut back or using alfalfa hay. Um, what we've seen is rolling the hay, the alfalfa hay out across several product paddocks perpendicularly. Uh, and then just moving the fence based on the bale that you have in that paddock. And that's changed the mentality of the cattle on grazing habits uh, greatly throughout the day. They're not waiting there every single day for you to show up for a bale. And you can't feed, you can't put a bale out there and show up every third day because that, that second and third day, they're going to be waiting there for uh, you to bring a bale out there when they really should be grazing and they're burning daylight. Uh, uh, on that aspect. But if you're moving the fence every day, uh, you can roll hay out across the landscape and divvy it out that way uh, if you're not feeding a full bale per day, uh, if you're using alfalfa hay as a protein source. And we've seen that change the mentality of, of livestock uh, greatly versus, uh, um, I, sh I shouldn't say we, other producers, I haven't done it, but uh, um, it's changed their livestock mentality greatly because that animal is grazing every single day. They're not, they're not sitting there waiting for a bale. And I've just noticed that's been a big, big improvement for some producers out there that I've seen with that hay and not utilizing it all in one day. And so uh, on the cattle side. Well, I'm gonna switch topics here just a little bit. Uh, <coughs> 
more towards the grazing side of things. And obviously this is, we are gonna talk about cover crops, but um, you guys aren't necessarily grazing strictly annuals, but can you touch on some of the concerns with prussic acid, nitrate issues with sorghums? And then there's also been some reports of uh, toxicity with hairy vetch. So I guess my question is, what are some plants that sheep, pigs, and cattle just won't eat and that are dangerous to their health? And uh, we'll let Brett start that one. My answer is any animal will eat any plant once at, at some point. You know, it might not be palatable at a certain time and year. They'll still take a bite out of it if they're in a competitive nature. Um, kind of starting back uh, to the prussic acid and nitrate, you know, that's always a concern. I still, I, I pay attention to what species I'm moving into, whether that's Johnson grass or sorghum sedan or forest sorghum. Uh, I've grazed uh, animals in higher stress environments. The biggest thing I can say is diversity. We can't stress diversity enough. Um, animals know what they need. And so that's one thing that you'll learn to train your eye to in a grazing scenario. If you're approaching a paddock, whether it's perennial or annual, and for whatever reason, you have a soil underlying issue where there isn't the diversity that you like there, you need to look at that paddock as a monoculture and find ways to diversify that. I see my animals, for instance, uh, have trained themselves to gourds, mare's tail, etc., and I'll notice a big difference in animal behavior uh, if there's not a the, not enough of those broadleaves in a paddock. Uh, they'll be looking for other broadleaf sources, and that's cattle, pigs, sheep. Uh, they will be looking for diversity, and so I think that's important to train your eye to when you're rotating or, or approaching a system, how much diversity is there, what's truly available for those animals to select, not just standing biomass. If it's standing biomass of a monoculture, that may not be the, bio, the biomass that they need. Colton, how about you? I'll let uh, Jonathan go ahead and talk. I know he's <laughs> passionate about talking about some hairy vetch. <laughs> <laughs> better unmute myself um yeah i mean what brett said on diversity is key never never graze a monoculture <clears throat> of anything but um i'll i'll start with the johnson grass because that's such a fear in the south um urban legend status nobody wants to be the person that lost other cows so everybody's so afraid of it but um you know coming out of row crop um Thankfully, the herbicides don't work in getting rid of Johnson grass. Uh, so that's our base forage while we're trying to build perennials. And so we live on Johnson grass um, and diverse, diversified Johnson grass, excuse me. Uh, not only Johnson grass, but as far as a base perennial that we have access to, Johnson grass is, is what we have uh, for warm season grass uh, while we're establishing these others and while we're using other species of, of annuals such as sorghum sudans that would be a higher quality. Um, and so while that fear is still there and every year coming into frost season, um, it's like, oh, are we, are we sure, are we sure? But, and I call the old timers that I know and, and trust and um, they assure me they've been grazing Johnson grass for 40, 50 years and have never lost an animal and we haven't either. And um, it's everybody's decision to make for themselves, but the thing that they tell me is, you know, as they're if they're eating Johnson grass all the time with other things, and it's in their rumen, as it's changing over, they're adapting as they're eating it, um, and so you you really don't have any problems. I think where we we see animal deaths is again animals that are too hungry. Um, they bust out of a fence because they're starving, and they go into the ditch where it's. Uh, heavy load of, of nitrate from runoff from fields or it's uh, around a hay storage facility and there's lots of Johnson grass it's pretty hot and um, they gorge themselves on that and then die um, so it is real but it's not something that we change our management practice because it's in all of our fields so there's no getting around it we're not going to pull off somewhere and stop our rotations uh, 
during the frost. Um, I will say a, a kind of a funny story. I, Colton's got a donkey in that picture. Um, donkeys are supposedly higher uh, susceptible to it. Um, and so we, we had a donkey that um, we got rid of for other reasons, but um, we used to send her in as a canary in the coal mine. And if she didn't croak in 30 minutes, we'd send the cows. <laughs> so you can do that too. But um, as far as the hairy vetch, um, it's everywhere in our fields as well. There's no getting around that. And uh, we have grazed very heavy stands of, of hairy vetch in every vegetative state, um, all the way through having seed pods on and um, have never lost an animal or had any negative effects to it. So that's my two cents on that. Again, diversity, diversity is key. Colton, do you want to comment at all or you want to pass us on this one and I'll move on? <laughs> we'll move on. I'm sure okay. we will. <laughs> that good. Um, why don't you guys touch here? Um, I'm going to ask you probably just about two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, explain your guys' rotations. How often are you moving and how does that play into what you guys are using for minerals, wormers, and other supplements? I'll start. Um, with our sheep, we have a kind of a hard and fast rule that they're not in one place, one paddock, um, any longer than five days ever, um, because that's the hatch cycle for the barber pole worm, which is their main parasite. Um, and so just by having that hard and fast rule, there's never a, a parasite hatch that they can ingest uh, because we're moving on to, to a fresh paddock. That being said, it varies. Uh, it's pretty rare that we're ever in there for five days. Uh, it's, it's more between one and two days or multiple times in one day, uh, up to three days. Um, and during lambing season, we relax that a little bit because uh, it's chaotic every time you move. Um, and so we try to gently move uh, by opening up the middle paddock line and letting them move at their own pace uh, over the course of 24 hours or so and then everybody slides over there and then we'll put up another back fence and then just kind of creep along that way a little bit larger paddocks a little bit longer time um, then once we get done with lambing and hit the active growing season then we're we're moving faster and trying to fluctuate up our uh, densities and diversity of that um, we don't use any wormers um, and any other supplementation other than uh, we keep a a three-way tub out that's got um, a mineral mix um, that's a, a low copper for sheep um, and then a dry salt I mean a loose salt and then we keep a mixture of diatomaceous earth and baking soda uh, or sodium bicarbonate um, in the other tub and that's all they that and water so Brett how about you yeah, so uh, I love the term adaptive grazing. Um, that's one of my favorites. It probably could be underlined as procrastinating um, sometimes, uh, but uh, I'm always adapting. Uh, I wouldn't say that I move intensively every day. Um, there's days that I'll take a weekend and move uh, three to five times in a day in an area that I want to change and there's times that I'm gone and on the road that I'm gone for three days uh, but I don't set the paddock for three days on on cattle I don't I want to things can happen while you're on the road you misjudge that you have cows out when you're gone so I'll open it up for a week on that and I'll squeeze them back down um, uh, climate can affect my rotations rain uh, I see that a lot that people get stuck in a system during a very very wet period and so what I try to do is I move a lot faster keep residue between the hooves with cattle and you can always come back to it when it dries up um, you can make a couple rotations around and so that's what I've kind of implemented uh, depending on the type of soil I'm on how much forage there and how much biomass is in between their hooves and the soil. I don't mind pugging up an area. Um, I use that as a mistake 
learning opportunity and testing opportunity to intercede something new or see something respond to that system. We have to remember that bison were on the land. You know, they weren't magically floating over the ground when it rained an inch, you know, a million bison. So they, they disturbed us all. They, they created wallows. Uh, I want to say disturbed, they, they impacted the soil and the soil tended to respond through rest and time. And, and so I try to implement that on certain areas that I want to make a drastic change in species. Uh, but I wouldn't say that I ever have a set rotation. Um, I would say that a drought plan is more critical than having a set rotation uh, on, on what you know you can run, what per year, uh, what's an initiative to destock before the markets drop. And drought planning is, is critical and undersought, I think, a lot, a lot of the times. Just because you are moving more and moving more and can run more animals on most years doesn't mean that it's going to be the year that you do that. And so having a marketing drought plan, et cetera, that can help you implement annual animals or temporary animals to come into the operation when you have excess forage and having a baseline stock uh, number that you that you need on that farm as much as possible even through a drought so i tend to stock for my winter feed and my my drought feed is what i try to stock my my farm to and then i use annual annual or animals that are flexible that can come into the system and leave in this leave the system within a year or even several months to adjust for those fluxes and forages to capture efficiency. Uh, for worming, I don't worm, I move. Uh, I'm not gonna say that my animals don't, don't ever get worms. If they don't breed back, they might, they might have it. They might, might be another reason why they don't breed back, but they get cold, they leave the system. Um, that's kind of how I've went. I've, I've done more Darwin selection because I'm gone and I don't have people look over my operation while I'm gone uh, very closely. Bat latches are, are very useful. I invested in those this year and that's helped me be even more efficient when I'm gone, but I still have underlying safety nets built into that system. So I'm going to be a lot like Jonathan in that never more than five days for the worm concerns, but also for the, uh, the rumen health. So when they, when the sheep come into a paddock, they're going to hammer like all the broad leaves. And that's some of your most mineral nutrient dense forage out there. And just reading this last winter, it sounds like the protein that they eat can remain within the system of the rumen for about three days. So if I can move every three days or less, which is normally it's one to three days for me, depending on time of the year, what I, what I want to achieve that, that week, that day. Um, as you can see behind me, I got a portable mineral uh, skid. Uh, it's got a water tank, a salt block, and a loose mineral. And so I dragged that from paddock to paddock, just behind the side by side, just some old maple logs and some two by fours. But um, I'm a, to add a little context, during the winter, you don't have to worry about the worms, supposedly. They go into dormancy, they're not hatching. And so then I'll just forward fence my stockpile and then I let them back graze. If I see them back grazing, that, no, that tells me that I'm not giving them enough ahead of them because they, they won't come backwards unless they ran out of what's ahead of them. And so then I just release the next stockpile forage. But that's how we stay ahead of it. And no, never worm. If they got a problem, they can go somewhere else or find a ditch. <laughs> the worms go dormant where you have winter, Colton. Yeah, context, Jonathan. Context. <laughs> so it is six p.m. Six fifteen. I'm going to open it up here. If anybody has questions, um, we do have a question here from Bruce. He says, "How do you guys get rid of foxtail from a sheep pasture?" He is in Bakersfield, California. 
So the the giant is it giant foxtail or or I look at that as a, a grass that is an annual. Uh, I try to approach weedy species that we may not be utilizing, and how can we utilize it? Or maybe it's an an you know maybe it's an animal aspect. How can you utilize it? Giant foxtail. You could run some chickens behind the sheet and you have seed for chickens uh, and capitalize that way. There's, there's opportunities there. Uh, some of those species are responding to lack of residue. I know sand burrs are a big one that do that. Uh, different weeds accumulate different micronutrients. So it could be a micronutrient in your soil that your, your soil is trying to heal. And that's why I look at it as each plant has a purpose at some point. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't serve our profitability or farm directly, but that's not the weeds fault or the plants fault. That's our fault that we can't capitalize on that or can't find a way to capitalize on that. So we need to approach that system kind of looking at that aspect. And a lot of those species will disappear or come in cycles if your management's not changing. We'll see mare's tail do that, come in three year cycles because the management didn't change and so the soil didn't truly heal. Um, that's kind of how I would respond to that. I have a beautiful seven acre patch of foxtail that comes up every year. And the trick is for me is I just got to get in there when it's in an early to mid vegetative state and they absolutely hammer it. It's when it gets that late vegetative seed head coming out, that's when the utilization rate definitely goes down. Have you seen the species change in that culture at all? So it's one of those fields that was soybeans, and then I just let it fallow kind of come up with whatever nature wanted to provide, and foxtail was the dominant species, and uh, it's going on its third year, and it hasn't changed too much, so I've been influencing it with uh, some domesticated cool seasons, chicory plantain assortment of legumes and grasses, but. Yeah, I think with species that dominate and, and take over, you know, we had in crop fields uh, where we, we pulled out and let nature take over. Uh, for us, it was white heath aster. Um, I didn't like the monoculture it created or the, you know, amount of food that it produced, but we did take uh, forage samples of that and send it off. And it was, quite a bit higher in quality across the board uh, than really high quality hay uh, that people buy for a lot of money around here. So, and, the, and it's palatable and the, the animals eat it. Um, but as far as switching that ecosystem, um, Brett said earlier, there's times, you know, and I think we all do this in adaptive grazing, there's times that you've got some time on your hands and you can affect change on that by hitting it with a higher, uh, Stocking density, um, the times of the year depend a lot. You know, if you hit that wet with a bunch of cows and you plugged it up, uh, you're certainly going to shift something. What we've seen in those times are after high disturbance like that, we'll get a lot more broadleaf flush. Um, so wild mustards, different kinds of brassicas, and early responders to the to the disturbance. Um, for us, we matched our enterprises based on what we were given. Uh, so after row cropping, we got a lot of forbs. Uh, and so sheep match that really well because they love to eat the forbs. Um, and then as we build these perennial uh, tall grasses back, um, we'll see how all that shifts, but we're liking the sheep a lot. Uh, they're also a little lighter footed on the heavy clay soils that we, that we operate on. But um, all that's to say is that our operation was influenced by what nature was giving us. Uh, and so we didn't try to dictate upon the land what uh, it wasn't ready to provide for. So kind of along those lines, we have two, two separate questions here, but both um, involving thistle. Sarah says, do you have any tips for grazing to get rid of yellow star thistle? And then Justin says, how do I get rid of Canada thistle without spot spraying? They run horses and cattle and have this issue in hay fields, but don't have the ability to graze. So really two questions, but how do you get rid of a star thistle with grazing and how do you get rid of Canada thistle without the ability to graze? I'll say a question that came up for me regarding some of these um, noxious plants or we, what we used to consider that um, is 
because I would hear people talk about using sheep to condition a pasture or to clean up the weeds from pastures so that your grasses are better. Um, but being in the sheep business and finding that they're an, an enjoyable operation and, and profitable, um, the question became, do we want to get rid of those things that they like to eat and that are mineralizing the soil? Um, and the answer was really no, we don't want to get rid of that. It's part of the diversity. Um, if it were <clears throat> taking over a spot and causing a monoculture, then that would be an issue. But um, if you're watching that and, and grazing it properly, I don't, I don't see that happening. Yeah, I have the same, same Brett, we're having a, a hard time hearing you. Well, we can hear you. It's just pretty quiet. Okay, Colton, do you mind answering that question here while while Brett figures that out? Uh, I'll, I don't. I'm not familiar with the yellow star thistle, so I won't go there. But the Canada thistle, I did have a patch here in my place, relatively small. So I went out and spot sprayed with salt brine. Now I know his question. It says don't have the ability to graze this site, but I'm not sure what you do there. Uh, without the, the herbicide, but uh, um, we sprayed some salt brine on it. It kind of wilted the plants and then it made it more palatable a few days later, but you got to make it pretty salty and you got to be in an environment that can then wash that salt back out of your environment. Uh, if I was a more arid region, I'd be more concerned, but not when we got 70 inches of rain last year. All right, Brad, are you with us here? It's quiet, but yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Well, uh, let me know if I'm blowing out your ears. Okay. Uh, so on the on the thistles, probably that's one of my biggest aha moments uh, when I recognize weeds as as a plant uh, that can. It, it's just another way to look at it. Uh, I encourage you to go out and look when you're looking at those thistles. You see the grass about a foot and a high, a foot taller around those thistles. And why is it doing that? Why is the grass or plants around that thistle taller than the rest of the field? A lot of times that's got a deep tap root that's tapping into mineral, deep residual moisture that's pulling it up to the soil, subsoil surface. We'll see this with chicory. Uh, we'll see this with other deep tap, tap rooted plants like alfalfa, uh, but even thistles will do that. And you see the grass two times more biomass, more lush, healthier around those thistles. And that's just the indicator that that plant is serving a purpose in that ecosystem. Now, in the hay field, uh, what I would encourage, because you don't have grazing animals, uh, I would look at rotating hay fields or hay areas. Uh, weeds are opportunist plants and so anytime that a weed finds an opportunity to spread it's because we're making the same impact the same time of year, year in and year out. So rotating that hay field around can change plant communities. Uh, allowing for more residue in the fall if it's getting a lot of residue taken off uh, going into the winter time frame is a good good opportunity for small seeded weeds to come in or thrive in that area because they get compacted over the winter time frame. And so uh, there's a couple ways to approach that, but I would say diversify the rotation within a, a hay field or look at rotating hay fields in and out uh, in, in a scenario like that. The yellow star thistle is the same way. Uh, it's not as aggressive as the Canada, Canadian thistle. Uh, I have some in my pastures here in Oklahoma. Uh, the cattle actually graze them uh, really late. Uh, you'll actually see them strip all the leaves off after a frost. Uh, don't know why uh, on, on what I've seen. Um, it's just one of those deals that it's serving a purpose. Even if you do let them seed out, you'll notice that how the plants move around. They don't stay in the same spot because they're picking different areas of the soil. 
Um, but I would say encourage the diversity. Obviously, you got to keep landlords happy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I try to ditch thistles if I need to. Uh, I also have four donkeys that eat all those thistle heads off. And so the largest thing is that they see is a purple flower. Well, if it, if it never flowers, they never see it. So those donkeys kind of serve a very good purpose for me, even though that I don't market them any other way. I have a, a last question here um, before we wrap things up. Brett Wright says, what about washy grass this time of year, grazing a fall planted mix, barley, cabbage, winter peas, ryegrass, tulips, and radishes? Not sure if that's, oh, yep, turnips. And Brett, I'll let you maybe work on your microphone here real quick. Jonathan or Colton, do you want to answer that? You're, you're muted, Jonathan. I wasn't ready to answer. I was, I was, re I was uh, reading oh, myself okay. a question, sorry. <laughs> I'm just putting you on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think I understand the question as far as, you know, getting too much uh, protein and, and being a little washy and, and, and runny. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm getting that right unless it, I'm getting the context wrong and it's somewhere where there's heavy rainfall and it's low in nutrients, but um, it's certainly hard to limit those intakes uh, whenever there's candy uh, out there available, then, you know, they're going to, they're going to go for it. Um, you can try offering dry hay um, on a trailer, like we talked about earlier, where you've got access and you can continue your rotation. Um, logistically uh, with the trailer like that um, but continuing to move but I, I would say on those covers specifically I think one thing we run into a lot with people is they they get a little too jumpy at turning in and they turn in too early and too early of a vegetative state and don't wait um, long enough for there to be a little bit more uh, carbon source than that to balance out the the CDN ratios in the plant um, and so they're there's a nutrient imbalance there and a washiness in the room. And hopefully I understood the question right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Well, no, I think that's, that's good. He can comment in if that wasn't uh, exactly what he meant by that. I did say that was the last question, but we've got Jimmy Emmons on Facebook is asking, is anyone <laughs> raising multiple types of animals together? We, we have, we're not currently during lambing season, um, but we have run the, the cattle and the sheep together um, in the past. Um, it was you know, typically the best time uh, to do that for us is after uh, lambs have gotten on the ground and gotten going and calves have gotten on the ground and gotten going. Um, so it tends to be kind of a mid to late summer time period for us that works well, um, getting into some of the the bigger species of annuals, uh, sorghum sudans mixed with, uh, you know, warm season mixes, um, and then on into the stockpile period. Um, I think we certainly will be doing more of that in the future, just because I don't want to manage multiple herds all over the place. Um, and so a lot of that is quality of life and sustainability for ourselves. Um, and so they also have a lot of good synergistic, uh, benefits to grazing them together because they're both dead end hosts for each other's main parasites um, and they're non-competitive grazers so um, a lot of good things go with it i will say when we did do that the the only issue that we had for a couple of days was introducing the dogs and the cattle together um, if you're going to do it bring the sheep to the dog to the cattle um, not the other way around because if it's the other way around the cattle are seen as an invader into that territory of the dog um, so bring the dogs and the sheep to the cattle. Um, and then, uh, an advantage for us is it was hot in the summer and, uh, it's kind of like dogs and cats in the winter. Um, necessity, uh, will, will drive enemies together. And so when there's one source of shade, uh, it took about two days before the dogs and the, the cattle were laying together in the same shade. And then after that, everything was fine. Brett, have you run uh, animals together at all? Can you 
hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I did have some sheep uh, about a year and a half ago for a little while. I ran them together. Uh, probably my biggest first mistake is I've trained my cattle to eat much more broadleaf than probably the average cattle herd. And so they took down too much of the broad leaves, and so the sheep started finding a way out uh, because it became a monoculture Bermuda grass field. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if you train your main animal to eat a lot more weeds, uh, broad leaves, and you go at, at a animal like sheep or goats, uh, particularly goats, goats require a much higher percentage diet of broad leaves. They need about 80% woody browse species. Sheep are about 50 broadleaf, 50 grass, and cattle are about 80, 20. And, but if you take those out through high stock density or training your animals to eat those weeds, uh, those animals will find a way out because it's not the, the food source that they want. And so that was my first mistake. Uh, but uh, I've ran uh, my pigs and cattle together. Uh, it's kind of interesting for the first day. Um, trying not to have the cows chase the pigs through the fence, but uh, uh, it kind of they they hung around. They didn't leave the countryside. So, uh, but uh, it's I would say start small on implementing anything like that on on getting those introduced. Fence line introduction is way better at first. I would agree. Let them introduce each other over a hot fence because each each one's going to respect that hot fence uh, versus just throwing everything together all at once. So the fence line introduction and then intermingling uh, works a lot better than just throwing them all together at once. <laughs> yeah, and I I do apologize. We're we're going a little bit over here, but just one final question I have for each of you. Brett touched on this as far as like the amount of broad leaves to grass. What have you guys found um, specifically maybe here on, on sheep, you know, what percent legumes, grasses, broad leaves do you guys like to have? Um, specifically to, you know, planted annuals or short lived perennials. I, we're, we're in love with chicory, um, chicory plantain. Um, we've, probably gotten a little too carried away with legumes over the years um, and we're finding that the that's probably inhibited some of our, our grass development and stuff but um, we we graze pretty heavily legumes because we have a lot of them uh, just volunteering growing um, but a lot of high tannin plants uh, broad leaves so like curly dock things like that that are growing uh, just wild in the fields um, what are some other spiny lettuce, uh, prickly lettuce, um, just a, a myriad of uh, primrose, uh, eating primrose. Uh, that's that's a hot one right now that they're loving to eat um, out there in the fields. But as far as planted uh, forage, I would say um, chicory is is one of our our very favorites that we've added uh, to our mixes. But then they'll probably ours is in a its fourth year of a stand right now and doing really well. Um, so they'll, they'll give you a good bang for the buck as far as the seed cost. Colton, how about you? But they're a, a tonic plant for the worms to the tannins and stuff and the secondary metabolites and that is, is why. And it's got some anti-bloat characteristics as well. So, I mean, the more you can diversify it with broad leaves, I'm, I'm thrilled to see them. Um, so up here in fescue country, uh, ragweed comes in during the middle of the summer and they've never met a match <laughs> like a sheep. <laughs> I got videos where you can go ahead and if you graze it right, the ragweed will come back and then you get to graze it again. And it is super productive during that time of year. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go and turn them in a paddock and they'll, they'll pursue mostly broad leaves and then they'll go back and touch on the grass day two or three, but the, they're not, it's not going to be their first choice, but. All right, Brett, why don't you round us out? You're, you're muted. Can you repeat the question again? I was typing up a response online. Yeah, um, 
what what percentage of broadleaves, legumes, brassicas do you like to graze? Um, and for you, maybe specifically on on cattle. Okay, on cattle, uh, I try to cut my mineral out as much as possible. So I actually push the broadleaves. Uh, it also is a buffer for me to leave residue because cattle aren't going to grease graze amount, large amounts of broadleaves, but they still will eat quite a few. Um, I try to do about 60-40, 60% grass, 40% broadleaves, because broadleaves typically are high carbon to nitrogen ratio plants, so broadleaves aren't going to leave a lot of residue, so I, I don't want to get over that 50-50 mark, I feel, with, life, or with the cattle, otherwise I'm not leaving enough grass residue for the next crop, whether it's a cover crop or my perennial crop for regrowth. So um, it depends. I'll range from the 20, 20% broadleaf to 40%, uh, but I try to shoot for somewhere in between there when I'm diversifying a pasture or, or doing a cover crop when I'm grazing. Yeah. Well, with that, um, we'll close up here. Again, sorry for going a little late, but um, first, thank you guys for tuning in. Also want to thank uh, the panelists for your guys' time and answering these questions. If you guys do have any other questions, um, you can email any of these sales reps. You can find their emails on our website. Um, and please tune in next week. We're going to have Keith and Dale back. They are going to be talking more specifically about perennial pastures and things like chicory plantain and going into more depth as to the characteristics of those species and taking cropland and putting it back to pasture. So we would love to have you guys tune in for that. I'll be sharing that link um, on Facebook. And if that's something that you're interested in, you can go find it there. Um, and we will also try to get that posted to the website. So thanks again all for tuning in and we hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Um, yeah, with that, take care and we'll see you next week. Thanks.